This section of the presentation on risk and return deals with the interpretation of the efficient sets, which is a set of the possible portfolios that a risk averse investor may choose to invest in. To construct the efficient set, we need two parameters. We need the mean of the portfolio and the standard deviation of the portfolio. The mean of the portfolio, of course, is the weighted average of the means of the individual securities within that portfolio. The standard deviation, as we have already learned, is not quite exactly the weighted average of the standard deviations of the individual securities. Yes, it does include the weighted averages weighted by the proportional investments to be made, but it also includes a measure of the diversification potential of that portfolio, namely the covariance or a construct that would represent the correlation coefficient. But that's what this last term here is. So now, this is where the key task lies how to calculate and interpret the standard deviation of the portfolio, which is a function of three important variables. One is the individual security risk. The individual security risk is measured by the variance of that particular security. So in essence, if you want to know how risky your portfolio is, it is also important to know how risky individually the securities within that portfolio are. Second is the covariance of the securities returns. Covariance, as we have already learned, is a measure of the diversification potential of the securities. The greater the covariance among securities in a portfolio, the less diversified that portfolio is going to be. And so as covariance tends towards zero and then even below toward negative numbers, that tells us that much unsystematic risk can be diversified away. The lower the covariance, or if you like, the lower the correlation coefficient, the greater is the diversification potential of that portfolio because the securities within the portfolio have very little in common. And so as you can see, if this covariance were to be a negative number multiplied by these terms here would cause this whole third term to be negative. And a negative number lumped together with the first and second terms would cause the overall result to be lower than it would have been telling you that the lower the covariance, the lower would be the portfolio risk. Finally is your choice variable, the investment weights, the W's. The investment weights represent the proportional investments that you're going to have in each of these securities. It is you that will choose that. The investor makes that choice. The investor really doesn't have much of a choice as to the riskiness of an investment or, or the degree to which two securities co-vary. However, the investor can choose whether to invest, say for example, 50% of his or her funds in security A and the remaining 50% in security B, or whether to make it 90% and 10%, 70% and 30%, etc. So that's the choice that the risk averse and um, rational investor, we hope, would make. Now though, to show how this works out, here's an example data uh, input data. We have two stocks, A and B, and these are their expected returns. And we could have used historical data or probability distribution to obtain these um, uh, data. And then we also have data regarding their variances, and we also have their covariance, which happens to be negative. So we feel pretty good that these two securities uh, are good candidates for a well diversified portfolio. For good measure, we also have their correlation coefficients, which is a negative 0.6. Remembering that correlation coefficients ranges between negative 1 to positive 1, this number here, which is closer to negative 1, tells us that um, the diversification potential of this two asset portfolio is pretty high. So now, what are we going to do? We're going to calculate the mean and we're going to calculate the standard deviation. 
but we have to decide what the proportional investments would have to be. For example, right here, if we invest 30% of our money in Security A and the remaining 70% in Security B, we find the mean of the portfolio to be about 10.83% and the standard deviation of the portfolio to be 8.6%. Now, in a separate spreadsheet modeling presentation, I show how to construct the efficient frontier based on these two calculations on a spreadsheet. So what you see here is basically the final product. So if you want to learn how to perform these calculations on spreadsheet, please make sure you watch the spreadsheet presentation entitled Spreadsheet Modeling for Risk and Return. So now why are we doing this? Well, here's the interesting story here. Suppose there are two stocks. Kellogg's, which is a food store, and Home Depot, which is a home improvement store here in the United States. Now, you have $100 million to invest in a portfolio of these two stocks. The question is, what portion of your $100 million should be invested in Kellogg's and what portion should be invested in, Microsoft, uh, in um, Home Depot? As you know, there are portions, there are ways that you can allocate your money that would not be optimal in that you're not going to make the most bang for your buck. If you choose to do it 3070 as the first exam as this example here shows, then this tells you how much you can expect to make with the based on this risk. Now, as you can see, there are other combinations that will fetch you a little bit more going forward. So really the question is, which combination suits you the most? Which combination would make give you the greatest bang for your buck, so to speak? So by constructing the efficient frontier, which simply is a way of calculating the risk and return parameters for different possible combinations, you kind of get a sense as to which combinations are reasonable and which ones are unreasonable. You just don't want to divvy up your hundred million dollars in any old way. Oh, by the way, for good measure, I also allowed for short sale. Short sale is a case where you borrow against the security and invest perhaps the borrowed money in a different in another security. So in this example, for in this example here you invested 100% of your money in Security B, but additionally, you borrowed 5% of your money against Stock A and took that 5% and poured it into Security B in addition. So here, what you're doing is to leverage your investment in Security B. So now, continuing here, what we're going to do is we plot those the risk and the return estimates. I go back here. We highlight these two columns of risk and return of standard deviation and mean and plot it. And when we plot it, we find something like this. And it looks good like this because I used, if I go back here one more time, I incremented my weight using, um, um, at, using the same rate of increment. Nevertheless, it comes out like this, quite nice, like a bullet. This portfolio A is our minimum variance portfolio because, as you can see, this portfolio A has the lowest standard deviation, which is on the x-axis. Security Z is the highest return portfolio because, as you can see, it offers you the highest return here of about 20%. Now, the question is, which of these port combinations or portfolios are good to invest in? Well, first of all, the ones below are not good. You wouldn't want to invest in this portfolio, for example, which for the same risk as this one up top would give you such a very low return of a little more than 5%. You're better off choosing this combination right here. So as you can see, if you put your money here in this combination, even though these this is the same asset A and B, but this allocation of money up here is more optimal than the one below here. So this gives us a sense as to what's good and what's not good. Nothing below is good. Everything above is good. Now the question is, 
where do you belong? Depending on your risk preference function, you might choose to invest in, in, in combinations down here, closer to the minimum variance portfolio. Someone else might like to grab the bull by the horn and move toward the security Z. If you sit out here, we call this the market portfolio, which is the portfolio containing all uh, securities based on their market value weights. I've placed some annotations on the sides to guide you. So now continuing, we use the CAPM model to show what would happen if in fact we introduce a risk a risk free assets into the mix. Now if I go here you would see that the least risky portfolio here which is called portfolio A is still risky because its standard deviation is not zero. But once we introduce a risk free asset then it will force the efficient frontier to begin from the int from the y intercept because that's the point where right over here we have zero risk a proxy for the risk free asset would be us treasury securities for all practical purposes it's those are backed by the full faith and credits of the U.S. government and so you know for sure if you hold the security until maturity you're gonna get paid your interest and you're gonna get your money back and so if you invest in that security in addition to your stock portfolio then there is the possibility that you may choose that you may wind up with a return at this end so basically the point to make here is this here is the risk-free rate of return now as you increase your holding of risky assets you're tending toward toward this direction. This is that theoretical market portfolio. If you chose a combination in between, for example, it means 50% of your money is in the is in an a, in a well diversified mutual fund, the other 50% 50, 50 would be in US Treasury securities. If you go beyond this point, it means you not only invested all your money in the market portfolio but you borrowed against the risk-free rate and also put that money into the market portfolio thereby leveraging your returns to place you a little bit above this uh, new market line the straight line so once the risk-free rate is introduced the the efficient frontier no longer becomes a curve this dark blue curve no longer exists we now have this straight line which actually has goes by the name capital market line so many of these concepts are explained here so finally I did want to point out what would happen if you have a, a stock portfolio that also includes a risk-free asset such as US Treasury securities so let's say for example that 70 percent of your money is invested in a well diversified stock mutual fund and then the remaining 30 percent is invested in a risk-free portfolio or in a risk-free asset let's call that security F M is the market index the market portfolio now this is the definition of how much you can expect to earn on average from your mutual fund it's the weighted average of the return on the market uh, portfolio plus the weighted average of your of the expected return on the risk-free assets so since you invested 70% in the market it will be 0.7 times the return you're expecting to earn from the market and, th th and uh, 0.3 times the return on the risk-free investment but here's what's interesting we can show that this type of portfolio will have a risk equal to 70% of the standard deviation of the market portfolio because if you look at this definition of the two asset standard deviation you'll see here that the covariance between the market and the risk-free rates would have to be zero because remember if something is risk-free then it's not going to react with anything else in the market it simply isn't volatile so to speak so this last term drops out also a risk-free asset will have a zero risk and zero variance that is so this middle middle term also drops out and so we wind up with only this first term which you see right here but you see the square root of two square terms as you can see here is the square root of the product of those two terms squared which of course you know that square root is to the power of one-half 
So it kind of cancels out this squaring and you wind up with WM sigma M, which is the weight, your, your proportional investment in the market multiplied by the standard deviation of the market. So that's what you see right here. That tells you if you have any mutual fund whereby, for example, 30% of the investment is in a risk-free uh, asset like treasury bonds and the remaining 70% is in stocks then this tells you that the overall portfolio risk would be equal to 70% of the riskiness of the stock portion of that mutual fund. This concludes this presentation. I am Pat Obi, Professor of Finance, Purdue University, Calumet.